How many of you have heard of Frederick Keen before? How many of you went to the talk that Stan Stevens gave, I think it was last year or a couple years ago? All right, not as many of you. So Frederick Keen was many things to many different people. I will talk a little bit about him uh, during this presentation, although the main purpose of the presentation is to talk about his railroads and his mills. And really it's the relationship between them that's always interesting to me is how communities develop around railroads and how railroads aren't always the first thing that you think of when you think of certain communities, especially today, since in many cases they aren't there. But Frederick Keene was really, I'm just gonna say, he was an interesting guy. He was the epitome of what made the Gilded Age gilded because he was a really wealthy uh, lumber magnate, property magnate. Pretty much if you are in Santa Cruz County, there's something Keene nearby a parcel he owned at one point, a building he helped finance, an organization that he helped found. And so the history of Keene in this county is something you can't get away from. So this is a picture of Keene right here. Um, this is from 1892, uh, and it's from a book, but it's a lithographic portrait. Uh, he was born in 1829 uh, from Brunswick, Germany. His original name was Friedrich August Keen, although the Heen was spelled... Uh -oh, I've lost it. Right. Keen was spelled very differently. Um, he came here like so many other people at 19 years old as a member of the Gold Rush. I'm losing audio every once in a while. And he didn't exactly succeed in the gold rush. In fact, he lost pretty much everything uh, to floods. Um, so then he decided to move to Sacramento, where he lost everything due to floods. And then he moved to San Francisco, where he lost almost everything from a fire, and then lost everything else in another fire. So by 1851, mind you, this is only two years after coming to the United States, he had absolutely nothing. And he was pretty much out of luck when somebody suggested to him, why don't you go to Santa Cruz? And this is an interesting thing because so he came to Santa Cruz and it's really vague what he did in that first year. According to some legends, although nobody knows for sure, he may have become, um, well in the time, in the time it was a multi-thousandaire, but in modern money it would be a millionaire. Uh, possibly from a gold claim that he got some uh, stock in in Gold Gulch, which we'll get back to later, but Gold Gulch was named that for a reason. And so he may have made some money there, and he used that to buy his first properties, which he then invested and bought more properties, and things moved on. Here's a picture of him late, later in life. He did many things very quickly. He became a county supervisor in 1862. Uh, he founded Capitola, which is right near here, as a nice seaside resort. It was all on his land. Uh, he was a state assembly member. He organized a Santa Cruz Society of California Pioneers, uh, which we will also get back to in just a minute. And this is probably where he got a lot of his power. He owned the water companies for about half the major communities in the area. And so he could charge rates, get some extra money, add to the land, use uh, federal and state laws to get more land out of this. And then just for fun, even though this one isn't local, he uh, actually uh, donated the land for Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. And he was one of their original trustees. Uh, this is a picture of him with his daughter. So land, that is his main claim to fame. At one point or another in his life, Frederick Keene owned roughly one-sixth of all of Santa Cruz County. Now, it probably wasn't all at the same time, but it was more or less at the same time. He owned uh, the coastal part of Rancho Soquel, which became Capitola, or uh, Camp Capitola. He owned half of Rancho Soquel Augmentacion. That includes pretty much all of the timber tracks up SoCal Creek. And so that's a huge piece of land. He also owned other portions of that rancho, which would include parts in Valencia Creek and Aptos. Here's a lovely picture of Grandpa Heen with his grandchildren around 1910. 
So the other thing that you have to know about Heen is while he may have done a lot of things that looked really good on the exterior, he still was in it at least a little bit for the money. I mean, nobody's just a complete, uh, what kind of word? Nobody's just donating all their time and money for no reason at all. So this guy, he, he was always interested in helping the community as long as it also benefited him as well. And his railroads are really where you see this. So his first railroad venture in 1861, which I must add is a number of years before the Transcontinental Railroad was actually built, he planned to build a railroad up San, the San Lorenzo Valley. That did not succeed. He decided to use a system that backfired on him horribly um, because he tried to uh, condemn land in the Cal the Jordan and Cal property, and they weren't having any of that, so they stopped him and made a landmark Supreme Court case that made it so you can't do that anymore. So, that failed. In 1871, he got this bright idea, I own a whole bunch of land in SoCal Augmentacion. Let's annex that, or get a railroad through that land, and then I can use that railroad to bring the lumber to market. Well, that also didn't happen because people weren't as interested and people were interested in getting a railroad along the coast. And so he pretty much abandoned his idea almost as soon as it was published in the paper and founded the Santa Cruz and Watsonville Railroad. After three years of more property problems, that didn't happen, but a new company called the Santa Cruz Railroad came about and that did succeed. The railroad that we still have along the coast today between Pajaro and downtown Santa Cruz is the Santa Cruz Railroad, more or less. A couple of the alignments have been straightened from the original one, but that railroad was finished in 1876. And so that is a quite old track. And it was eventually bought out by Southern Pacific, which was not a bad thing because the railroad cost Keen a lot of money. So the reason why the Santa Cruz Railroad was important is it went right through Aptos. And he had a lot of of land, or he had a lot of land up Valencia Creek. And so having the railroad go there was very convenient. And if you've ever seen where the railroad goes in this county, you will notice that it goes out of the way to get into Aptos. It doesn't need to do that. It could just follow the coast straight from Capitola and continue. But it bypasses and it comes inland just at Aptos, just so it can get a little bit closer to his land there. And that is not unintentional. And at the same time, the Loma Prieta Lumber Company, which hadn't been formed yet, but all the investors were already involved, pretty much, they also knew that uh, Soak, or, uh, Aptos Creek would be harvested. And so it was a huge deal. Everybody wanted the trains to go up Aptos and Valencia Creek, so we moved the track to Aptos. Now the last venture is the South Pacific Coast Railroad. He was not an investor in that, but he was a huge beneficiary and he donated some land. He donated about one mile of land near the headwaters of SoCal Creek. The news broke that he had done this about a week before he had, or uh, the uh, final alignment of the railroad was decided. People put the pieces together and realized, oh, he donated land in SoCal Creek so that the railroad would go through his land. Because before, the railroad was probably gonna go or possibly it was going to go straight down SoCal Creek, which would have benefited him still, but it would bypass the San Lorenzo Valley where he also had land. And so the, he got two for one. He donated a little tract of land, it bypassed, or went through the top of SoCal Creek Canyon, and then went over into San Lorenzo Valley, so then he got both his timber, major timber tracts, all on the South Pacific Coast Line. Very beneficial to him, and We'll get back to that later. <laughs> All right, and I said I'd get back to California Pioneers very briefly. This is a Cherry Street uh, depot. Uh, it was between Cherry Street and Park Street in Santa Cruz. Anybody know where those are? Union You've got one. What was that? Union and Chestnut? Union and Chestnut. Basically, yeah, it, it's where the Chestnut Street extension is. The Chestnut Street extension is Park Street. It was renamed because I guess Chestnut Street extension sounds cooler. And uh, Cherry Street doesn't exist anymore. It is a small little alleyway 
uh, that's sort of still there. But when the Santa Cruz Railroad first came, this was the route that they took. And so this is just downtown Santa Cruz is just behind that building. And that building there, the upstairs was the California Pioneers, uh, the California Society of Pioneers main headquarters. And he kept an office in there. And that was his primary office the entire time he operated, uh, probably until 1893 or so. And I choose that year because that's when the building seems to have been demolished. In 1889, Heen technically retired. So in a funny twist, almost all this talk is after Heen has already retired. He didn't retire very well. He really liked to keep his fingers in all the cookie pots. And so he founded the F.A. Heen Company, which was kind of the equivalent of a tr family trust. And he had all his children and his children-in-law lead the company. And they really did. I mean, all of them were adults, and his daughters ended up keeping the books. His sons actually lived at the mills. It ended up being a big operation. All right, moving on from Keen, I'm gonna have a quick little detour here because I imagine a number of you don't actually know how logging really worked in the Santa Cruz Mountains, and it's gonna be kind of essential to know this just to be able to go on. All right, so. Logging in the Santa Cruz Mountains. This is a lovely picture of the milk crew at Valencia uh, posing on the railroad tracks. So step one is the easy one. You cut down the tree. This could probably be multiple steps because you have to climb the tree, you saw the tree. Sometimes they do it in chunks like they still do it today, but usually they'd actually just sit at the bottom uh, on little boards and they just saw and saw and saw until it fell over. And then once it was on the ground, you actually have to chunk it, uh, cut it into chunks. And so that's what these people are doing, they're posing, but you can see the saws sitting there and they're gonna cut that into ch chunks in a moment. Now the next one's the interesting one. There are multiple ways to get the logs to the, uh, to the lumber mill, and specifically the mill pond, because that's where you always take the logs first. Um, you notice all these trees are debarked. That's something else that's done at the uh, site. You take the bark off of it, and the main reason for that is because you see this thing that these are being dragged on, this is a skid row, or a skid road. Either one works. And the skid roads are a bunch of smaller trunks that get greased heavily all the time. And they pull, and you got an oxen team in this picture. I say this is Valencia Mill, but this actually may be Lomo Prieta, but that doesn't matter. It's the same process. And so what you're gonna have is you're gonna have an oxen team drag these down from the top of the hill, wherever they're felled, and it's a very tedious process to do, and they'll bring it down to a railroad track or down to the mill pond. Now there's other ways you can do it too. That big uh, engine back there is a steam donkey. A steam donkey would attach a cable to the tree, and then that would drag it. And it's the same kind of process, you're just trying to drag these stumps, these big, or these big uh, logs, down to the mill pond. And then this is another, or this is a picture of the mill pond. So, in the mountains, for most of this talk, we're going to be talking about train cars are doing this delivery. So you have a train car here, it's dumping the logs off into the mill pond. Obviously those trains will also, or slightly, uh, possibly those trains, possibly ones uh, that are also held by the mill, will also be delivering the lumber to the actual yards, um, which will come up in a minute. But So they will soak in that mill pond for days, minutes, However many logs they have, the ones at the end, it can take weeks for those. And the main reason you put them in the milk or in the water is it protects it, it gets bugs and other stuff off of it, it keeps them from, uh, from splitting and cracking, and it also protects them in case there's a fire, because as you will see, fires happen a lot with mills. These machinery, or this machinery, it has sparks. These mills are often very dry places other than the mill pond. Uh, this is the first band saw that ran at, Laurel's, at the Laurel Mill around 1900. Uh, before band saws, you'd have a steam driven, just a straight saw, and you would push the log through using a conveyor belt of some sort, and they would just go up and down, and band saws ended up being a big help because it wouldn't put as much strain on the uh, middle of the, the saw. Those things had to be replaced all the time. All right, and then the last step is shipping stuff out to sale. And that also usually uses the railroad. In fact, in all the cases for this talk, they will be using the railroad. And this is just the mill. 
uh, Laurel again, and you see these huge stacks of lumber. Uh, all those would be cut into what's called board feet. Board feet is a one foot by one inch piece of wood uh, that's measured in foot, in foot lengths. So these are all more than one foot. And you're gonna need to know that term because that's how they judge the efficiency of a mill, is how many board feet it can produce per day. All right. All right, moving on to the actual mills. So we have a number of mills we're gonna be covering. Some are less researched, some are poorly photographed, some are really well photographed. And so if it seems like I'm focusing too heavy on one, that's just because I don't have enough photos or enough info for them. Uh, the mills that we will be covering in this talk, there's actually five because one of them, it, both of these are on Valencia Creek, but one is on Trout Gulch, which is near the, the confluence of Valencia Creek with Aptos Creek, and the other one is about three miles up. Then we have the Laurel Mill up there, the Kings Creek Mill, and the Gold Gulch Mill. Um, I also point out the lumber yards. The Heaton Company operated a number of lumber yards. This may not be all of them, but these are the ones that I know about. Uh, their main yard was the one at Santa Cruz. It was located just behind the Union Depot there. And their uh, second yard was in Watsonville. It was built across the street from the Sparkles Yard, which is basically where the depot is today, just across the street from that. Uh, and then in the 1910s, it moved to the site of the Sparkles Mill, so on the other side of the, uh, the depot. And the Capitol Opal Lumber Yard uh, switched ownership a number of times. It was owned by Heen, but he kept leasing out to Loma Prieta. But that was located on the cliff, cliff right above Camp Capitola, or Capitola Village. So the very first mill that we're doing is Trout Gulch. I have no photos of this, so all I can just give you is a quick rundown. It was built in 1883. It was the first mill that Heen built that we know of. And what's really interesting about this is it actually predates the Loma Prieta mill by just a few months. Loma Prieta mill wasn't, or the railroad at least, wasn't completed until November of 1883. The Loma Prieta mill was the one that was up Aptos Creek. It was heavily, heavily financed by pretty much everyone in the county and the railroad and the Central Pacific Railroad, which owned part of the Southern Pacific and eventually was consumed by it. So the so this mill often gets really downplayed. It had no railroad at the time because it didn't need it. It was just down the hill from the Aptos uh, tracks. And Loma Prieta really has a lot more going on. And I have to admit, you guys have already had a talk a few years ago, I think, of Loma Prieta, where it's been talked about before. Uh, the Loma Prieta mill was crazy. I don't know. You can tell that money was behind it, that they even built that thing, because it went so far up the creek that through these canyons and stuff. It was just absolutely crazy. And the Valencia Mill is not nearly as impressive because it was just a narrow gauge railroad. And so this first mill, it just sat at the bottom of the creek, 30,000 foot board capacity a day, which isn't that much. I mean, it's a, it's a small mill relative to a number of other ones. As I said, it had no railroad, so we're using oxen and mule skid roads. The problem we'll see is that these oxen mule skid roads, you have to go three miles to get the wood to the mill, and these things are coming three miles, so they're having to go, and these, you have to oil these things. It's expensive to get these things down, and the wood down there. So it closed after the very first season. So they took everything at that mill, and they moved it three miles up. I like, go, oh, this won't fix the problem. We'll take the mill, we'll move it three miles up the creek, then the skid, ro uh, skid roads don't have to go as far. The oxen don't have to go as far. It up the capacity, so now it can do 40,000 uh, board feet a day. And they did eventually realize, oh wait, now we just have to haul all our finished lumber down the yard, it did the three miles. Oh, that doesn't work, because then you just have to replace them with donkeys on really heavily laden wagons. I mean, you guys have seen wagons before, they get, it, it, second they're in mud, everything goes to crap. So, that did not happen. So after about a year, they started, they realized, let's buy, or let's make a railroad. And so one year in, Keen bought all the property that he didn't already own along his proposed railroad. Uh, the next year, he started using mules. And mules make sense. You don't have to pay for a locomotive. You can just tie up a mule. And going downhill, which a good portion of that was, 
you can just let gravity take the trains down and then the mules can pull the empty uh, flat cars back up. And so it seemed to make sense, and that's how they were doing when, oh, I told you there were going to be fires in this. You will not know the history of the Santa Cruz Mountains unless you know what fires are. <laughs> November 29th, 1886, and the mill burned down. So we had this mill, the, start, or the machinery in it was moved from Trout Gulch, and it's all gone. I have no idea why my map is on this page and not earlier, but this is the original site of the sawmill. So this is a Trout Gulch one. It's a little bit of an approximation. We're not exactly sure where it is. It could be a little bit higher. Then up here is where the Valencia mill was, the first and the second Valencia Creek mill. Uh, I marked the roads on here that still exist today, but that also existed then. So you get SoCal Drive and Freedom Boulevard. And then all the black lines are railroad lines. So you can see the Loma Prieta and the Valencia Railroad pretty much did the same exact route on their respective creeks. Loma Prieta did start getting really off track eventually. Uh, mind the pun. But you have the... And you can see down here also, the yard is actually really messy. The Aptos yards had numerous uh, sidings and spurs. It had a little bit of a Y that eventually appeared for the Loma Prieta. And somehow this uh, heen narrow gauge had to pop into the middle of this. So I will show you a map of that in a second. Oh, a couple seconds. Okay, so the new mill that was built at, or the first mill that was built at uh, Valencia Creek, I've got some pictures here of it. This is when they were building it. You can see they probably are actually using the mill while it's under construction because the first thing they do is they install the machinery and then they build everything on top of it. Well, the first thing, the first job that they have is milling the stuff that they need to build the mill. So they set up everything they can, the bare minimums with the machinery, and then they go from there. And you can see here, this is the mill again from the opposite angle. And this is actually a little high contrast here, but this is actually a skid road up there. And so that's where the oxen are going to be taking their stuff. And this is while they're building the mill, because later that's going to become, uh, or that's pretty much going to get buried by the mill pond. All right, so I arbitrarily stuck this. Almost all the pictures we have seem to be of the first mill. So just mind where this is placed. So the second mill after the fire was rebuilt over the winter and spring of 1887. It was upgraded to 70,000 board feet capacity. Now that is pretty much the same capacity as the Loma Prieta mill. So you can see that Heen's really saying, hey, there's a lot of potential here, we can compete with them. And sure enough, they actually did. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, it employed up to 200 men a year. Uh, it's continued to use oxen and mule skid roads, but it had an eight mile narrow gauge railroad. And this is an actual railroad with the locomotive. All the cars were built on site and I'll just go to the next. And that's pretty much what the mill looks like at its height. You can see all of these, some of these are tramways, like this one's a tramway. Tramway just is pretty much the exact same kind of track, but it just doesn't have any, the train doesn't go up on it. But over on the left there, you can actually see the real tracks. Oh. Yeah, and also there was a box and a planning mill built there. Now box mills, they're exactly what they sound like. They're just factories that make boxes. They ship them out for uh, fruit supplies and stuff. So when you see the, when you see like oranges and those old fruit boxes, that's what they're making. But planting mills, when they have those on a site, that usually means that they're actually kind of confident in the quality of their wood. So when you're making just standard board feet wood, it's raw. It's untreated wood. There's nothing special about it. It's in a design that one inch by one foot size is something that you can really just turn into anything else. And so you have a planning mill, which turns it into more finished wood. So when you go to San Lorenzo Lumber or, or Orchard Supply, that's all going to be already planed wood. And that's the point. It's, it's, it's something you can actually construct with. And so when a mill actually has a planning mill on site, that means they're going to be exporting usually wood to order. So a company will say, we want you to provide us with this kind of wood and they will make it there. They don't have to build it at this or at the uh, lumber yard, which a lot of uh, these mills had them at their lumber yards. They can actually do it right on site. All right, so you can see the tall stacks of lumber in front of the mill here. 
Obviously, they haven't been picked up for a while, so they probably are due for a nice pickup. Uh, the, lar the yards got really busy, and this is a constant problem across the mountains. These lumber railroads often washed out. You got three miles of track between the mill and Aptos, it's gonna wash out every once in a while. And so that may be what this is reflecting. This may be a good season and they just had a rainstorm and the track got washed out so they can't get the trains running. Or it could be that they just are, the market isn't as good. Sometimes they would produce tons of wood, but there were financial crashes all the time in the 1880s and 1890s. So maybe there was just a crash and nobody wants to build anything anymore. So going back to Valencia Railroad, they bought an engine called the Betsy Jane. It was a Porter engine, a saddleback locomotive. It's purchased brand new, at least according to Rick Hammond, in April 1887, and it was apparently not the same as the one that was used by the Santa Cruz Railroad, which had the exact same name. I'm a little suspect. I haven't actually seen any proof either way. I just know that it exists, but it does look very similar to the one from before, and that one seems to have stopped being used right around 1887. So there seems to be a weird convenience going on here. So they could actually have been the same one. But yeah, so they bought an excursion car for it because they did have a little bit of passenger service. We don't have any pictures of that excursion car. Uh, all we know is from a newspaper article that said that it arrived late. All the freight cars were built on site and we do know that was transferred to Gold Gulch in 1895. However, when the Gold Gulch mill closed, we don't know what happened to it. So I have a suspicion, but we'll get to that in a minute. When they graded the line, they used Chinese workers. The Chinese workers probably came straight from the Loma Prieta line, which had just been finished uh, construction earlier. Uh, this was one of the last operations in the county that used Chinese workers before the federal government pretty much outlawed having Chinese in the country. So. Yeah, gotta love the, the 1880s politics. But so in 1886, they graded the entire line. This is just an example of one of the donkey trains. So this may be one of the ones from before the steam engine came in, or it could be taking the, the, these logs down from on the top of the hill. That's right next to a mill pine, you can see. Not as many logs floating in that, as in that other picture. Here's another one. Oh, and this one has lumber. Note that this one had logs, and this one has lumber on it. All right, and then this is up, uh, up the railroad a little bit more. You can see some mules up here. They have another train full of them. So this would definitely be an area that the, the engine was not operating. This would just be a spot where they would have the donkey crews being taking logs down to the mill. Now here's an actual picture of the Betsy Jane. Now Betsy Jane is hauling logs down to the mill. It's doing it backwards. I actually was told once why it was doing it backwards, but it's probably because of the grade. It, I doubt that it actually had any spot to turn around. So it probably always operated in that direction. And there's another picture of it, also backwards. So now it's got a car on its rear and a car in its front. And you can see this is an excursion train with a photographer. So you've got a bunch of ladies sitting on this flat car that has some uh, siding or some fence on the side, and there's a photographer getting off the train, and there's another lady and some men on the, the uh, spillway. So they just dump the, the logs right off. You can actually see the, the ramp back there, and they would just dump the logs right off the back of the train, and would just roll right into the mill pond. So it was a messy operation, but as long as the mill pond could hold the logs, it was fine. I said I'd get back to this. So this is just a map. It's, a, it's not 100% accurate, but it's pretty close. Uh, it was done in 1889, and it shows Aptos, downtown Aptos, and the main Southern Pacific line runs at the bottom here. And so this right here is the route that goes to the Loma Prieta Mill. And this is the, the Southern Pacific Railroad. And this is the Valencia line. And you can see it splits off into three. We don't know when they come back together because it's still three miles from the mill. But also you notice these cross at almost right angles. This never actually joined the Southern Pacific Line. Southern Pacific Line was standard gauge and this was narrow gauge. And so what they did is they had a, a lumber yard and an unloading area at the end, at which point they would transfer it to wherever they needed to take it. They'd take it to other actual lumber yards that they sold them from. They'd put it on Southern Pacific trains and send it out to San Francisco, to 
San Jose, wherever. And you can see right here, Aptos Mill Lumberyard, that is probably Keen's Lumberyard, not the local creator's Lumberyard. I have seen one picture of that yard, I just don't know where it went. All right, and I said that I like to talk about the communities that develop, and there was a community here. It was called Valencia. If you go up there today, there are two buildings left. All the little tracks, the, this is what that was originally parceled out as, all those parcels are gone. None of those roads exist anymore, except for the main street, which is basically just Valencia Road. In fact, I believe the main road now just crosses over the creek right about here. And so, there's not much there. The only things left are the town hall, Valencia Hall, and the school. And here's a picture of the school. And the school wasn't founded when the mill was operating. The school was founded in 1898. Because what happened is when the mill closed, he decided, he realized that a lot of his workers wouldn't be continuing there. Loma Prieta Mill already probably had plenty of workers. I mean, they probably poached a few of them, but they're not all gonna be moving to the next mill at Gold Gulch. They wanna stay in the community. Well, now there's a bunch of hills that have no trees on it. So he stumped the trees, which means sticking a stick of dynamite in it and blowing it up. And now we have these beautiful places that we can uh, grow apples and other orchard plants and probably vineyards. And so if you've been to Aptos, which I assume most of you have, there is, uh, what's it called? The, the I'm blanking on the name. Oh yes, the Village Fair Antiques. The Village Fair Antiques building is the old apple barn that he bought that as a warehouse. So the people who used to work in the mill, they would get their trees, they would use his railroad for a number of years, although probably the engine was gone by that point, so they're just using flat cars. They would take wagons, they'd go down to the, today's Village Fair Antiques, and they would store their apples there, and they'd ship them out, they'd sell them to people. It was a whole thing. So the town of Valencia actually did quite well for a while, and unfortunately the school closed in 1931. I'm not sure when the post office closed, uh, but there was a post office up there. And, but the town was still there clearly by, in the early 30s. And the modern school, I think, only opened in 68. So there was a good 38 years. And the modern school is down at the bottom of the creek, where this was up three miles at that subdivision. So this little area, the old train line and the mill, the mill would have been just kind of where the town of Valencia sign is. And then the uh, train would have been on the left side there. I kind of wish this map showed that, but I guess having a mill in a picture probably doesn't look very good for advertising. All right, moving on to Gold Gulch. Yes? Um, where is mill pond? Where is that located now? Like the mill pond? You think it would be easy to identify mill ponds, but it actually isn't all the time. Um, the mill pond for that was probably right next to the town, um, just down in the creek. And the mill ponds were always upstream from the mills because then they could use the actual flow of the water to push the logs or help bring the logs into the mill. And then that would mean that the other side, they could just dump the logs. So I'd say it's probably right next to the town. And you're actually, you kind of imply something incorrect. The mill was probably just a slight bit south of the town. So yeah, uh, you'll notice um, in one case, it seems that the mill pond may have been placed at a horrible location for one of these mills and I'm not quite sure why, but they corrected it after an accident. <clears throat> so, any other questions before I go on? Yes? Uh, when you talked about the post office and the uh, school building still being there, are you talking about right where Fox Road and Bear Creek Road came in and went Yeah. <laughs> I'm not actually great with those things, but uh, John says yes. So, yeah, I know that they, uh, I actually stopped there just yesterday, and yeah, they've got a gate in front of them. Yeah. The school isn't there anymore. It's the post office and Valencia Hall. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The school's gone. It was on Aptos. It was on Valencia School Road. Uh, I imagine the uh, the post office used to also be a small general store store of some type. Yeah. You'll you'll find that's usually the case. Yeah. There were three very tall poles or smokestacks or something at the Valencia Mill. What yeah. Are those? Uh, those are. 
those are usually exhausts. You'll find that at all the mills in the background there. Um, all the mills have those. Um, they're probably exhaust for the steam engines that are running there because all the mills at this time were pretty much operated by steam engines. And the thing is, you really don't want that exhaust to be exhausting straight into the mill because they sometimes had sparks, they sometimes could cause uh, heat related problems. You're always trying to avoid that. So the higher those, the higher those smokestacks can go, the more likely the uh, embers will uh, stop being hot by the time they hit the ground. All right, I'm gonna move on. So we have the uh, Gold Gulch mill. So Gold Gulch is in Felton. Uh, I had on that first map, but it's in Felton, just south of town. It started as an attempt at a gold rush. Whenever there's one gold rush in an area, you will always find attempts to find other gold in related areas. And the Sierra Nevadas aren't that far away from the coast range. And so when you find a little bit of gold, like they did in 1852, 1853, you want it to be lots of gold. And so in Gold Gulch, the rumor at least is, is that they found a huge nugget. And when it, or at least a huge rock with a ton of gold in it. And so in 1853, the first claim was filed. It didn't make a huge thing. There's still a lot of gold in the gold country, so people weren't quite as interested. But three years later, in 1856, they made another discovery, which became known as the Chittenden claim. Uh, I assume that is related to the same Chittenden that Chittenden Pass is named after in Watsonville, or east of Watsonville. Uh, but basically, everyone invested in this. If you've if there was an important person living in Santa Cruz in 1856, they probably had a little claim in this claim. So we have people like Frederick Keene, Elhu Anthony, who built uh, two of the piers in Santa Cruz, or helped, uh, yeah, helped build them. Isaac Graham, who owned Rancho Viani. Isaac Davis and Albion Jordan, who owned the major lime company in the city. Joseph Majors, who was married to one of the Castros, and is from Majors that uh, Heen actually got his claim to the SoCal Ranchos. Uh, you have Peter McPherson, who I do not know how he is related, but I can guarantee you he is related to the McPhersons of the Sentinel and Bruce McPherson. And then we have all these other people. Oh, there, I found my typo. <laughs> John Porter. <laughs> that should be John, not John. Okay. And then we've also got William Waddell and James Reed of the Donner Party. William Waddell for Waddell Creek. So this was a huge thing. And people continued to mine even after the area was subdivided in the 1920s. They continued to mine the area, and they never found enough money to make it worth it. Because even when they got a good gold claim, it would cost them a fortune to find that gold claim. And this is the only picture we have, and it's from 1920, uh, as a gold sluicing operation on Gold Gulch uh, from a state minerolo mineralogist report. That's the only picture I've ever seen of Gold Gulch uh, during that time. So the mill there, followed in the same pattern as the Trout Gulch to Valencia move. So it was built in April 1895. They moved all the machinery, not the wood, but the machinery, over from Valencia Creek. It had a 70,000 board feet capacity because, well, the mill that came before it did, so it should have the same capacity. But interestingly, it only employed about 40 men a year. I suspect this is an understatement and it may just be a bad report from one year because the other mill, you'll remember, had 200 people. Now this one was the last operation he had that still used skid roads with oxen and mule. And if you've ever been to Gold Gulch, the reason for that is it's really narrow in some of its canyons, and so it makes and it makes the most sense for that to happen. Um, but this is the only mill that he immediately had access to the railroad, and it's not quite clear who built the railroad. Even it possibly could have been built by the Southern Pacific because it's only 0.5 miles away from the, the old, it was called the Old Felton Branch at the time. It was the, uh, a little remnant part of the Santa Cruz and Felton Railroad. But it was a narrow gauge track, half a mile long, and it seems to have been built immediately, and you can't, it couldn't go any farther. The, if you've been down up uh, Lakeview Drive, you can only go about a half a mile before you have to climb a really steep hill. There's no way a railroad's gonna go up that, so that was pretty much the end of the line. They optimistically built a brick mill there because there's some limestone up in the hills. The brick mill was able to produce 100,000 bricks at a time, or at a, a year. Unfortunately, there's a lot of cheaper 
people or keep, in cheaper operations in the area making bricks, so it didn't actually make any money despite its efficiency. Um, it only clo or it closed in November 1898, and the newspaper says twice it was for want of lumber. They just didn't have enough lumber. It wasn't a huge claim, or it wasn't a huge uh, lumber tract, so it only lasted for four seasons. But there was a gulching operation. I haven't explained gulching yet, but gulching is a very simple concept. You usually do it with uh, mules, and you just go up in the hills and clean up all the remains of operations. So after a lumber crew will go in, they'll cut down all the big trees, they'll cut down all the medium trees, then they'll leave and go to someplace more profitable. Sometimes there's a lot of stuff left over. There's stumps that could actually be used for uh, things like firewood, things like uh, grape stakes, fence posts, uh, even in some cases railroad ties for narrow gauge trains. So what they would do, and they did this for two years using a Japanese crew, because the Chinese had already been outlawed in the country, so now it was the Japanese's turn to work for the railroad for bad, bad um, money. And so they came in and they did that for two years. They gulched the gold gulch, which seems like an appropriate place to gulch. <laughs> and that was it. That's all I really have on the gold gulch model. There are no photos of it except two of some of the operations. So here's gold gulch. Felton is actually a teeny bit north of there. You have the San Leandro River. And then gold gulch is here and breaks into gold gulch and Boulder Brook. And he owned both, but uh, Gold Gulch itself actually gets really narrow here, so he went down to Borderburg. If you know Forest Lakes, you know that there's a pond there, a seasonal uh, swimming hole. That's basically where the mill sat. And then the mill pond is basically the parking lot behind it. And you'd think it would be reversed, but no, that's how it works. And so you get this, uh, it breaks off into, I think it's McClellan Creek is that other little, it's, uh, little bit you see there. And yeah, in the railroad, so this little spot here was called Fahim conveniently named, it's just Keen's initials. And it was an official stop on the railroad for actually 10 years because the track remained in place until 1908 when the railroad closed, or when the, uh, this branch line closed. And according to one story I've heard, the tracks were standard gauge to just about here. All of this was removed, but because there's still some machinery here, this was actually removed first, and then they had kind of an evacuation where they evacuated some of the wood and lumber that was still left, and then the track was removed. So that was all gone by 1909, and access to Old Felton, basically modern day downtown Felton, was done from a different direction after that. All right, and this is the one actual picture I have 100% guarantee it is gold gold because it says it right on it. <laughs> It's always convenient. Now that actually isn't always a giveaway, but in this case I'm pretty certain it's true. And you can see, they're doing an oxen skid road down the hill there. And this one comes up as Gold Gulch, so I'm going to say it is. It possibly isn't, because it doesn't say it on it. But History San Jose claims Gold Gulch. And this is actually interesting, because you can see in this one they're doing oxen, but here we have the new technology of the steam donkey. And steam donkeys had already been used a little bit by this point, but this was a big, this really made things more efficient. They just hook up the steam engine, they'd have to drag it up to places, but once it's there, they just stick it in the ground, and they'd use a cable hoist to pull the logs closer to you. So you put it wherever you need it to go, and you use the cable hoist, and you pull it closer to you. And if you're on a mill, you try to pull it towards the mill in the mill pond. So there's a nice crew posing for that one. All right, and that's all I got on Gold Gulch. So we'll move on to Laurel Creek. Now, how many of you have, guys have been to the town site of Laurel, the Laurel Curve off of Highway 17? And I'm guessing most of you guys were probably looking for railroad stuff. <laughs> well, Laurel is a very interesting place. Up high in the mountains, it's just about a mile and a half south of the summit. Off of some, or three miles down Schulte's Road off the summit. Uh, and it's a place that really the railroad always needed to go and it just never quite got there. Uh, in 1871, I'd already mentioned he tried to make he tried to make a railroad that went down there. And then he negotiated a different path because the tunnel was coming out in a slightly weird angle and it just wasn't gonna work, so they put it someplace else. 
Then in 1877, he convinces the South Pacific Coast, let's get this thing happening, but it kind of skirted the top of the ridge rather than going down directly through his paths, or through his lumber tracks. Um, however, in 1878 to 1880, a company named Elbone and Huak, or Hook, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, they operated a sawmill. It had to have been under contract from Keene because it was completely on his property, and Keene often would have smaller operations um, work. He'd pretty much say, this is what you can do, don't have a mill that's bigger than this, and you can work the land and get some of the cut. So he built it uh, slightly off of Burns Creek um, near the entrance of the South Pacific Coast Tunnel that went to Glenwood. In other words, he built it on the town site of Laurel. And he, or an elbow and hook, they, when they first opened, they provided wood for the tunnels. So the original Southern Pacific, South Pacific Coast tunnels in the mountains were built almost entirely from Heen lumber. And then after, and there's tons of bridges there, so he also built that. Then after that, he continued to provide fuel wood to, these, uh, to the railroad, because the railroad would go up there, and that was the summit. It was the top of the grade. The trains would be exhausted and would need more wood. And so that was another uh, uh, benefit. So they did that probably until the Southern Pacific took over. So moving on to the actual mill, here's what, this may not be 100% accurate because they're not a, a map, so I am working on this with uh, photographic evidence for a lot of it. But it seems that the mill pond was under the uh, Hotel de Redwoods, which is Redwood Lodge Road. The sawmill was there, it's not clear how the creek got culverted. This is actually Socal Creek, this is the west bank of Socal Creek. It may have been culverted on the other side. I've seen pictures that seem to show both, or they could just be reversed. So I'm still working with that. The cable tramway, um, this seems to be its southern limits. It may have gone a teeny bit longer, but not much. And then this one, I was conveniently able to actually show a little bit of the yard. There are a total of three tracks there, two of which actually went quite a ways. And then you also see the two tunnels. This is a one mile stretch between the two tunnels. The main tunnel is the Summit Tunnel. It's the one that's famous for having an explosion in 1879 that killed 32, I believe, Chinese workers. It was a big thing, and they were operating in this valley from 1878. And then the Glenwood Tunnel, which had no problems at all. There was a fault under there, but it didn't have natural gas, fortunately. So that one had no trouble at all, but there were workers in here from at least 1878. So keep this map in your head as you look at some of these pictures. And I have a lot of pictures that will be coming up after this slide. <laughs> okay, so their first Laurel Mill, it was built in November 1900 using machinery from the Gold Gulch Mill. Like we're just passing that machinery on, which means this machinery is actually at this point from the Valencia Mill. Uh, it was located at the headwaters of the west branch of SoCal Creek. The headwaters there split between Burns Creek which goes straight, pretty much continues north, and Laurel Creek, which turns right, turns east, I should say. Uh, the original mill's capacity was 45,000 and employed about 100 men. So again, we're looking at about 100 people from the same machinery that was used at lunch here with 200. So there's something going on here with the numbers. I wouldn't worry too much. Uh, they did initially use, probably not oxen actually, they, they used mules definitely initially, and they built a cable tramway really early on. And a cable tramway is a railroad. It just doesn't have a locomotive. It has all the tracks. It was originally a narrow gauge route. And so you have a narrow gauge track with a cable in the middle of the road. And you hook up the car and you just turn on the button on the uh, steam donkey, which would act as a winch, it has a barrel, and it would just pull the thing up to the top of the hill. And we'll see some pictures of that in a minute. There's a box and shingle mill here. Uh, shingle mill is exactly what it sounds like. They take little pieces of wood and they turn them into shingles. And you can make a lot of shingles. And just like what happens with all our lovely mills, this one burned down! Again, Santa Cruz Mountains are not too fortunate with their uh, mills. If they're not having fires in the mill, they're at least having fires all around the mill. So this one burned down September 1st, 1902, and it burned or 1.5 million board feet of lumber with it. Now I said that the mill pond here seems to be a little wonky. I think they realized this when they lost all their lumber. So this is why you ship lumber. There was a little bit of a depression at the 
turn of the century, so that could have been part of the issue, but yeah, you gotta get the lumber off the yard because otherwise it's just a huge liability. So most of the pictures I have of this mill are actually of the very first mill. Um, I've split them between the two though just to show, um, just to break them up a little bit. But this is them building the mill. And then this is the huge stacks of lumber that are going to burn down in a few months, inevitably. <laughs> and so you can see the mill here. This is the Heen Company office. He actually, his uh, son, Frederick Otto Heen, uh, actually stayed on the site for a number of seasons and lived there. Um, and that also was probably the bunkhouse right next door, which included a cookhouse in it. And the, I believe this building is the one that survives in a modified shape as Redwood Lodge. So right now it's apparently damaged, but it was until recently a wedding venue that is still off Redwood Lodge Road. So this is the bottom of the yard. So you're gonna have skid roads coming down from here. This is basically a road to Soquel-ish, but not one that you'd wanna travel on. And this is the end of the track. So you have the main track coming down from the, up at the railroad grade, coming here, but crosses over here as a little switchback and that goes into the mill. So that's what I have in the picture. Yeah, so that's the little cross over there, although the dotted line's kind of messed it up. All right, and this is the original mill pond, and it seems like it's backwards. And I tried flipping this, and then that doesn't work. So I'm not sure what's going on with it, but I think that may have been a reason for the fire. <laughs> it's just my own suspicion. So this is what the mill pond actually looked like in the later years. So this is the Hotel de Redwoods Road, Redwood Lodge Road. You can see it loops around here, curves really tightly, and then continues this way. And the mills, you're basically standing in the mill in this picture, and then you're looking out. It's a very small mill pond, which is kind of surprising, but I heard that they did have some issues getting wood there, so they may have just taken the wood directly to the mill in most cases. And this is just another picture of a skid road coming down. This one's probably coming down from Burns Creek, just to the north of the mill. All right, so it burned down, so we need a new mill. So the second mill was rebuilt in spring 1903. Uh, it had a 50,000 feet capacity, so we got a teeny bit more out of it, but still, that's kind of relatively low. Um, the bigger mills in the county were doing 70 plus. Uh, we, there's also fewer people hired, 50 to 80 people, and that declined quickly, and I'll explain why in just a second. Uh, the skid, at this point, they got rid of donkeys almost entirely, and all, they have installed a number of steam donkeys throughout the region, and all the skid roads basically were just using steam donkeys to pull the lumber up to the mill. And then they still had the cable tramway, which did serve out the fire. They did rebuild a shingle mill, although I couldn't find any evidence for the box mill, so that seems to not have survived. Now this is the interesting thing though. This mill had a problem. April 18th, 1906, what happened? Earthquake. Earthquake. Well, if anybody knows anything about the mountain with the railroad, well, Summit Tunnel collapsed. And well, it didn't quite collapse, it shifted six feet and the train couldn't get through anymore. Uh, Glenwood Tunnel mostly survived and a little minor repair. So what happened is that mill got completely isolated. And the isolated mill couldn't get any other stuff out, which will be a point for the next mill on the list. But what they did is they cleaned up the Glenwood Tunnel and so they could get trains out there. The problem was there was slides in San Lorenzo Canyon, so all these trains would just go to Fountain, and then they'd be stuck there. So some of them did help with some repairs, but most of the crews ended up just going to join the Southern Pacific as a short-time job to repair the lines so they could actually work again. And then what eventually happened is the Summit Tunnel was actually the first one to get repaired. It was done by the end of 1907. And so then they repaired and upgraded, or I should say upgraded the Glenwood Tunnel to the south, so once the summit tunnel was repaired, all the lumber could finally get out, and it went to San Francisco. Most of San Francisco is built with lumber from this mill. Maybe not most, but a lot of San Francisco in 1906 was rebuilt with this lumber, starting in 1907. And then in 1909, the entire line reopened. Uh, the cable tramway seems to have been upgraded to standard gauge, and I do have a photo of that. I will get back to it in a second. We'll get back to it in a second. Uh, but it did, did get upgraded to standard gauge, and that ended up being, but it, it was a very, 
It was a very inconsistent period. So for about five years after earthquake, the mill seems to have not opened continuously. They'd open for a couple months and then shut down again because there just wasn't, there was a financial crash after the earthquake. It makes sense, I mean, San Francisco pretty much burned to the ground. And so the crisis, despite the fact that they needed wood repair, they didn't have any money. So it actually was a number of years before San Francisco really got its feet on the ground again. So this one, it did operate until 1914. And just to get back to the cable tramway, uh, it had a 13% grade at its steepest point. It only ran for 0.3 miles, uh, and it had a one inch steel uh, cable that was wrapped around a uh, drum, and that's how it got up there. And this is where I was saying I know, have a suspicion. It was a locomotive drum, or a locomotive steam engine that ran that drum. I very much suspect it was the Betsy Jane. So the Betsy Jane probably was cannibalized for its parts and turned into a steam donkey that would run this. And yeah, no, no locomotive ever operated on a tramway from what I can tell. And so here's just a little photo story of the tramway. So you can see it. So this is a lumber car down here. Oh yeah, and the tramway only, hauled, this tramway at least only hauled completed lumber. And then you can see it going up around the corner here. This is a very sharp turn. You can see the mill also, which is nice. This is just another angle. It's still going up this really steep. This is the 13% grade part. This one's empty right now. But, and you can see the cable line there. These are two pictures of it going up. Uh, this photo here is actually the narrow or standard gauge one, and this one's a narrow gauge one. You can see the tie lengths are different and the gap between them is slightly different. And, uh, by the time, after the mill moved, which is probably when this was here, or right around the, uh, the cable still there, but this is when the mill wasn't being used as much, it became a tourist site, like everything else in the mountains. This is it going up that final grade. This is the future Laurel Road. It, at this time, it was just a private road, but it didn't have any place to go. Highway 17 wasn't built yet. And then this is what the top of the grade looked like. And so it would be coming up under this bridge, come up to right about here, and then would back off onto the Southern Pacific tracks. There was a loop track here that picked it up without blocking things. But the funny thing is if you had more than one or two cars, they had one place to go, and that was into the tunnel itself. So they often were backing into the tunnel for hours while they're trying to switch things in this really small yard. So the town of Laurel itself, which is up on the hill, it was founded in 1882 uh, as Highlander. It, it was founded as both Highland and Laurel. The railroad called it Highland. The post office called it Laurel. Whether he had anything to do with the name Laurel, we're not sure, but uh, Hammond believes he, he was involved in the name. Uh, the original thing was a boarding house, boarding house for the permanent employees of the railroad that was stayed there to watch the tunnels. Uh, there were cottages for them, there was a post office, and the school developed, and those all popped up around 1882. Schultes Road was built just around 1882. That's the now washed out road that goes up to the summit. It was built just so the people on the summit had easy access. The only other access would have been rights, and that road is about three times as long and really twisty. Uh, and the Hotel de Redwood also opened up around the same time. That was just a little Basically, the Hotel de Redwood was a little tourist stop up in the hills, a little motel up there. Uh, by 1887, there was also a general store, blacksmith shop, and a dance pavilion, because why not? Everybody wants to dance. And the general store was owned by Heed. It was a company store. The post office was inside of it after 1887. Uh, Southern Pacific finally relented and said, OK, it's not Highland anymore. We can call it, it was Laurel. And that was in 1889. And so because of how remote this place was, everybody had to live on site. And so they either lived in little cottages up in Laurel itself, or they lived in these single men's uh, bunks at the mill. And these are just some pictures I have of Laurel. So we've got, that's a depot up on the hill. And of course it had a depot. You can see on the back that to the left there, that is um, the Heen Barn. I suppose it probably just kept supplies for the, the mill for the, uh, or at the top of the grade, but I have no idea what it actually held. <laughs> you can see it's really prominent in that one. And you can see the tunnel there, that's the tunnel to Glenwood. You can see how precarious this track is, it's right on the edge there. 
And this is a view from inside the tunnel. So this is the little loop track that was there. This is after the incline's been removed, but the incline will come off right off that end there. And then this one actually I think has the incline still because that's about a decade earlier. And you can tell that's from the narrow gauge days because it's a wood frame interior. This is my only color photo in the whole thing, and it's actually not that well of a colorized photo, but this is uh, around 1910. You see the little jingly things, that little, um, oh, what is it called? The gallows. Uh, that made sure that if your train had proper clearance. Now, you have to be fair, if you've already made it through the summit tunnel, you better be able to make it through a tunnel that's slightly taller than the summit tunnel, but, you know, you still have to have these little clearance things, and the little jingly bells would tell the engineer if it's uh, too high. And just a couple more pictures of it. That's the uh, boarding house and the general store behind there. Uh, they got really fun with the red or with the white rocks at one point and uh, decorated the hill. All right. So the last mill that Keen owned was the Kings Creek Mill. And at this point, we've already gone up to Laurel. We're pretty remote, but this is even more remote. It was built in September 1907 on something called the Newman Track. Newman Track. Sorry, one sec. <laughs> Make sure I get that right. Yeah, the Newman track. He bought that track. So this was not his own land. He actually leased someone else's land because Laurel just couldn't produce enough to keep up with the demand in San Francisco at the time. So he needed a mill that could actually get there. And I don't know how Kings Creek worked. They must have already repaired the tracks to Santa Cruz by this point. So 1907, he releases this track up at Kings Creek, uh, just at the mouth of Lo or where Logan Creek and Kings Creek meet. Uh, it's five miles north of Boulder Creek, but not on the San Lorenzo River. You go up the San Lorenzo River, then you go up Kings Creek. Um, its capacity was only 30,000 board feet, and this one I actually believe. This one only employed about 50 people max. Um, everything was done with steam donkeys, and it closed in November 1910. And the reason it closed then is probably because the Laurel Mill actually was able to keep up with demand by that point. And these pictures I'm really hoping are the Heen Mill because there was another mill on Kings Creek, but unfortunately they don't specify. A lot of the mills just say the creek they're on. So these ones are a King Creek Mill, hopefully they're his, but it does have some interesting features such as I don't see a mill pond in this at all. And there are a number of photos that do not show any mill pond. There could have been one upstream around the corner, but there's certainly not one in this area. And then it has this really cool kind of pitchfork looking uh, a tramway. This would have had a little track on it, and you could wheel the lumber from the mill to the stack. So it made it easier to load them. You could load them from above and just kind of drop them down. And you can see a little bit of the platform in the front there, and then just the mill. And then this is in the middle of it. You've got a fun little, uh, this is a mule team, although they're probably hauling lumber from here down to the railroad grade. And they've got little bells on them. So there was no railroad in this, so I lied. One of my uh, mills does not have a railroad at all. But that doesn't mean that they didn't try. They tried on multiple occasions. Southern Pacific was discussing for years standard gauging, standard gauging a line to uh, Doherty. Uh, the Doherty line was a private line that went north of Boulder Creek, uh, a total of eight miles or so in the end. And for years, there was talk and talk and talk of standard gauging this. Before the earthquake, they were planning to go to Pescadero. After the earthquake, they're thinking, oh, maybe we'll go to Vasona Junction, which is north of Los Gatos. Uh, we may go to Saratoga. And the, the Vasona line was proposed twice, uh, in 1907 and I think 1911. And in both cases, they talked about going up Kings Creek. And the grading of Kings Creek could support a railroad. And it seems that he may have just been waiting for the railroad to finally build or take over the line and standard gauge it for him to actually put in a train here. But that never happened. And so what ended up happening was he had to go two miles down from this mill to the San Lorenzo River, at which point he could load the, the cars onto, or the um, lumber onto the railroad that was there, which is a narrow gauge line that lasted until 1917. So that was pretty much it. There was no railroad up here, but there was plans always to build one. And so we move on to the end. So, the Heen Company kind of had an inglorious end, uh, at least its lumber operations did. In 1909, 
uh, a huge lumber firm on the West Coast called A.P. Hammond Lumber Company bought a controlling interest in the F.A. Heen Company, but they only bought the rights to the lumber yards. So the mills themselves seem to have actually stayed within the family. They just had an exclusivity contract that meant they had to only sell to the, the yards they, they have an interest in. And the new company was founded as the Heen Hammond Lumber Company. Now, this, unfortunately, was sold in August 18th, 1913, to Central Lumber, and there seems to be no mention of Heen's holdings at all. So at this point, I think he just got bought out. And there was just no Heen in this at all. But you'll notice 1913, that's only a year before the Laurel Mill stopped its operations. So it seems the Heen mills are kind of done by this point anyway. And Heen is definitely done, because five days after Central Lumber bought it, he and finally uh, succumbed to the illness that he'd been suffering for about three years, and he died. He died at his house on Locust Street in Santa Cruz, and that was it. I mean, he hadn't been involved in the railroad or in the mills personally, probably for about ten years by this point, but his family certainly was. And so the end of the Heen Hammond Lumber Company, coinciding with Heen's death, is kind of a strange coincidence because that's pretty much it. That's almost the complete end of it. The only thing that's weird is in 1918, August 1918, I found a single reference to a heat mill still operating somewhere mysterious in the county. It just says the heat mill is still operating. I have no idea where. I found one mention that a mill was going to show up at SoCal, but no evidence for it. I found another mention that one was going to show up in Aptos, but no mention. I have no idea what this last mill is that's only mentioned once, and then that's it. And so. Is a, a picture of A.B. Hammond, a guy who bought out Hammond, er, bought out Heen, and a little advertisement for the yard. And that, my friends, is it.